Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 700, that's 700700 with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing fine wherever this podcast may find you. Can you believe it? Episode 700. I nearly said 100, but 700. Episode number 700 of this bloody podcast, and I'm ever ever so grateful that i get the opportunity to come and rant into this lovely microphone down through your ear, you know um ear canal and sometimes touching your soul i absolutely love it i think this entire project of doing this podcast as i said previously was really an attempt at me to kind of you know it was an attempt at self-therapy in a way because i had this tendency which i usually which I unfortunately still do nowadays, where I tend to kind of speak to myself a lot. Um, people might call it self-affirmations. People might call it PMA, whatever it may be. But there is a little bit of a concern in that I usually have sometimes full-blown conversations with myself about current topics, about my dreams and aspirations, about interactions I've had with people, about maybe these made-up fights in my head that I'm kind of, you know, specking out what I would have said and what I didn't say. All these sort of nonsense is going on. So I thought, you know what? The best place to kind of brain dump all of that kind of self-speak would be via the medium of a podcast. And back in the day when I first started this, my first sort of like introduction to podcasts were like Tim Ferriss, um, the author of the legendary book, The 4-Hour Workweek, which kind of, in my opinion, spearheaded the remote working um fiverr gig economy virtual assistant type of mold that everybody is sort of ascribing by nowadays and then obviously podcasts like bill burr which is obviously a solo podcast that i kind of follow a lot and obviously the legend that is joe rogan but essentially a lot of that kind of stuff that i was listening to back then it kind of felt like and it's probably still to feels like this to this day where you kind of feel like you're a flyer in the wall um with these two guys or whoever is guests on these shows having a conversation right they're having a really riveting conversation you maybe look up to these people you maybe aspire to have the same sort of lifestyle that they do you maybe aspire to do your own thing whatever it may be but hearing people who have maybe figured life out in some degree talking about topics you know that maybe you are interested in or maybe you don't know too much about is pretty inspiring and can be kind of eye-opening especially for someone like myself who doesn't have many friends so when that happened I was like you know what that's pretty sick I can do that myself and it might help me with the self-speak so I started recording this podcast I started you first doing it via a dictaphone I had this little Sony dictaphone thing which I think I still have around here somewhere it's like an mp3 stick it's essentially it's a little it's a little micro stick that also kind of you know doubles up as a as a dictaphone that I'm assuming journalists would use when they're um, doing their interviews and whatnot and um it worked pretty well i'll just speak into the microphone i'd kind of rip the audio put it up onto itunes or podcast whatever it may be and keep it going after a while of kind of doing that a lot of times and kind of seeing the positive feedback i was getting and just how much i was enjoying it i started little by little investing in some equipment and started to take it a little bit quote unquote seriously but in the end or at, you know the kind of the main crux of this is still the fact that it allows me an opportunity to kind of dump all this self-speak that I don't tend to kind of have the opportunity to talk about around the dinner table, you know, in the pub somewhere, wherever it may be. Because even if I did have a big social group of friends, I still don't want to be the person holding court, you know, dictating or, you know, kind of, um, yeah, dictating the flow of the conversation and brain dumping all of my frustrations and worries and aspirations onto other people i think that's incredibly rude incredibly entitled and i'd rather just do it here so all of you and none of those people out there that are listening to my worries and my strains and my struggles and my plans and successes i do thank you for not giving me much pushback not telling me to shut up and allowing me to kind of live my best life on this place so i really do like it and then the other thing i was mentioned i was kind of thinking about when it comes to the seventh hundred episode of this podcast it's also given me a very black and white um, account of how long it actually takes to achieve quote-unquote greatness how long it actually takes to achieve the you know what i want to end up achieving which is essentially making this podcast pay for itself so i don't have to kind of pay my monthly hosting fees out of my own pockets and whatnot and blah, all the other stuff associated with getting a podcast up and running the equipment studio you know along the line when i do eventually get it and then of course providing me with an income that's allowed me to kind of pay rent that allowed me to go on my little holidays and whatnot and have the lifestyle that i like and buy the things i want to buy but essentially just a kind of 
a semi decent lifestyle. Let's say let's say anywhere between the the realms of like thirty grand plus in terms of covering my yearly expenses, right? There will come a point where this podcast will do this. And it's gonna be interesting to see what number episode that is. What number episode I come on this podcast and say, Hey guys, guess what? This podcast is now full time. It's now allowed me to kind of go full time and quit all my jobs. I'm now doing this primarily. Thank you for your support. It's been amazing. As a total of my of my appreciation, here's a fucking reward for you fans. In this competition, you get this, whatever it may be that I end up doing, right? But I wanna see what number that's gonna be because I think in my life. I've had one thing that's always been kind of, you know, hold me back a tiny bit, which is not set lack of self-belief because I do think I'm amazing. I do think I'm the best ever to do it in all this malarkey, right? I have very insane delusions of grandeur, especially um, in comparison to what I've actually made and achieved in my bare hands. It's crazy. But one thing that's always held me back has been procrastination. I've always been the kind of person that's never shipped and I think that's why I kind of preach the gospel of shipping so much and that kind of comes from Steve Jobs um, RIP when he was at Apple and essentially saying that you know ideas are what they are everybody's got ideas Every, anybody can sketch anybody can come up with a concept um, idea or concept piece of artwork or whatever it may be or a line sheet pdf or whatever um of you know of a collection that they want to make but rarely do people actually put their money where their mouth is um get some samples put stuff into production and actually ship um the items that they are talking about making and i think for me when it comes to my creative pursuits i just never followed through i have all these amazing ideas i'm thinking back to kind of some of these little t-shirt ideas and little pieces of you know memorabilia that i had when i was doing my club night back in the day with my friend miles from from before you know really cool ideas from t-shirts to zines to cameras to hats and shit to like bottles like all these crazy little things even i had like a design for like a, a particular kind of beer bottle that i was going to design if we ended up collaborating with like heineken and all these brands back in the day when they were trying to do loads of activations around youth culture and club nights and going out and the night scene and shit and i never followed through doing it there was an idea there was a plan to do i remember at the time because i think the alibi was like owned by this guy called dino who had this kind of collective creative agency sort of thing called real gold and he was planning to do some sort of like i forgot what it was exactly but if i remember correctly it was some sort of like anniversary t-shirt collection thing with all the different promoters that did club nights in the bar that he owned called the alibi which is obviously owned under the umbrella of real gold i didn't follow through with that loads of other things i kind of didn't do and most of it was just procrastination because i look through my hard drive now i've got like three of them my little lacy hard drives and i've got my i've got folders full full of pfd sorry P, pdf png line sheets of t-shirt ideas of i've even got ideas for like combat pants and cargoes and you know whole collections of stuff that i wanted to do graphics and pieces of artwork that i went to put on t-shirts and never flipping followed through and i think the podcast was the first time that i finally did kind of put my money where my mouth was and actually followed through and you know haven't basically missed an episode haven't skipped anything basically i've been doing it every single week since the start and it's been really amazing to be honest it's been an amazing hobby but it's also been very um, illustrative of just how long it takes to achieve your goals and also it's kind of showed that if i am consistent if i do show up if i do kind of believe in myself if i don't need to ask permission and i kind of go for it then usually things kind of work out and for the most part i've also realized that at the heart of it I am a true bona fide creative, like truly, in the sense that this isn't, you know, for profit. I'm literally spending money making this thing, right? Um, I get like nearly, sometimes nearly a thousand views on the four episodes on YouTube, maybe half of that listeners via the audio platforms and shit. So it's not crazy Joe Rogan numbers. So I'm not doing this because it's making me tens of thousands of pounds. It may do in the future, but for the short term and for the medium to long term, it definitely is a hobby that I'm just loving to do. I legitimately love, love to do. And I think that's something that I've kind of been encouraged to see myself like, okay, cool you are a creative in the true sense of the word and that you just want to get your voice you just want to have your voice heard you want to have a point of view you want to have your point of view out there you want to share some of your experiences you want to talk about some of the projects you're working on you want to talk about your inspirations um your life goals your travels relationships fashion whatever stuff i'm talking about on here music i love to do that and the fact that i'm just doing it in a selfless manner 
it's great to see that it's also touching people and that they reach out and say, hey, I like this, I like that, I like that. It's fucking been amazing. Even though that's not what I'm looking for and I'm not looking for anyone's validation or I'm not looking for anyone to give me permission to do anything, it's also nice to know, even though I'm kind of approaching it in a very selfish manner, um, that it's actually touching people also in this way. So I just want to give a kind of shout out to all you guys who have been here along the ride. I don't care if you joined on episode one if you enjoyed on episode 47 255 400 or even just this episode now 700 i thank you from the bottom of my heart for just being here listening to me when i when you can and just kind of giving me a chance because this has been one of the greatest hobbies and greatest fun things i've done in my adult life for a long time and especially now that i'm going through this kind of quarter life crisis where i'm kind of figuring out what my hobbies actually are outside of clubbing because now that's become a little bit of a shit show it's quite nice to have this one thing here that can kind of tether me and kind of hold me down when i'm a bit confused i'm a bit lost so thank you everybody out there for holding me down i appreciate all of you <clears throat> talking about holding people down the other day i had opportunity to go and stay in an airbnb for a couple of days because i had you know some stuff to do at home and shit house or occupied so i had to kind of go out there to kind of do work and obviously do my podcast and shit and um first of all the first thing i realized the airbnb market is completely fucked it's not what it used to be i think the days of old where you could essentially get a pretty decent apartment for the price of anywhere between like 150 to 250 on airbnb in a place like london because i've done it previously before where maybe i'd want to have like a boozy weekend or if i wanted to just record and do live streams all night i think one time i rented out an airbnb to basically watch the ufc um i think no i forgot what it was i think it might have been like football and then it might have been boxing and then it was UFC so it's like a whole marathon um kind of day of activities and I kind of rented that an Airbnb so I can kind of get wild and kind of do that without any distractions and without kind of bothering my neighbors so that was decent enough to do but over the years I've noticed especially via my travels in Berlin the Airbnb scene is a bit odd in that if you want a decent property like if you're on a property that I'm kind of looking for which essentially is a place that has good wi-fi a place that has a lot of natural light a place that's you know decently enough furnished it doesn't need to be like it doesn't look like it needs to look like a show home but it also can't look like a trap because I'm going to be recording video content in it right so it kind of just has to cover those three bases and in the area I'm not really too bothered about but if you want to those, if you want to cover those three bases that I mentioned, and to fall into the price range of one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty, you're still going to be looking at, unfortunately, a trap, a place where, for the most part, it seems like they're these kind of in between places where they kind of look like a hostel and they kind of look like a bedsit in that it just doesn't really suit kind of the necessary needs that I particularly have and then sometimes in the places I ended up in where I went the last couple of days, you end up in a place where essentially what it felt like where I was at in my land. Um, it was like this weird kind of flat which was on the ground floor but unfortunately had no window so no natural light was coming in but then it also felt like it was a place that was converted from one big flat so they basically took one big flat space and turned it into free good idea right but then obviously because it turned it into free the wall separating all three rooms was essentially made out of plywood so you could hear when the other person next door literally farted so when i was sitting there recording or live streaming I kind of felt a little bit self-conscious because people were hearing me talk but I also felt a bit bad because I'm talking really loudly I'm talking really fast I'm really passionate about what I talk about and I'm kind of feeling like I'm imposing myself on them also so I had to sometimes wake up early in the morning to record I'd sometimes wait to hear if people left and then I'll start recording and then by that time it'll be a bit warm in there so it's kind of getting really hot like a fucking sauna so it's just a bit of a nightmare but it did make me realize that this whole Airbnb thing that I've realized in Berlin, which is not the greatest anymore. I feel like nowadays, if you want to go to Berlin and actually have a decent Airbnb, especially if you want to stay in your own place and you're not a psycho that wants to stay in the private room of other people in, in someone else's home is absolutely insane. I can't imagine anything worse like going to Berlin for a party weekend, all right, and then having to stay in a home of like a couple with a kid right and you're there in the fucking spare room going crazy playing your tunes you know racking up lines and shit it just wouldn't be nice so you want to have your own space to kind of do your own thing and if you want that you're gonna have to be spending 
250 euros upwards there is no any more good deals under 250 the last time i did check to go to tbilisi in georgia i did see a lot of places there that were pretty much in that old price bracket of before where you could find a lot of good places for 150 i think even when back in the day or sure, a few years ago when we went to flipping primavera i remember we found some pretty decent places that essentially we were able to get for the three of us that went that time we were able to cover you know split i think 150 to 170 the cost of the place that we went to but nowadays the price is just incredibly high so i guess if you want to go abroad or if you want to have a weekend away from home especially if you're in london you most likely will have to this way you have to do just book a regular hotel that's a really sad part about this whole thing. Regular hotels have now become the thing to do um, if you want to have a weekend away because obviously you don't have to deal with the annoying key exchanges, which is always fucking difficult. You don't have to deal with just waiting for the person to fucking wake up and answer your emails. Like what happened to me, I planned to go to an Airbnb. I had booked two um, in London to go to for the last couple of days because my house was occupied and shit. And then, you know, I ended up having to have both of those get cancelled because one of the places said the guy, the, you know, I turn up there and the guy says, oh, by the way, the Wi-Fi isn't working. And the other place, the person wouldn't check me in in time. So I was basically waiting around in a pub, drinking myself silly, eating a fucking... 20 pound burger and chips and the chips came in a fucking cup that was like this big in caps and pond that really made me you know question my life choices and then by the time i ended up finding the place third time as a charm in my land like i said it had no windows and all the walls were made out of plywood and i couldn't really get off the way i wanted to get off no pause i don't bloody care so that was a big concern but it did really clarify to me that when I do do my weekenders away to Berlin, to go Berghain, to go Paloma, to go RSO, to go to Oxy, to go to Aden, to go to Club Division, all these places I fucking love, I have to really book it far in advance and actually get a decent pad for like 300 euros, which is insane because essentially I'm paying half, half a month's rent for a weekend to go away somewhere which is fucking wild or i'd have to pay maybe a little bit less than that to go to a hotel which is a bit stale um you know i always find hotels kind of feel like hospitals sometimes they're always incredibly warm um which doesn't really help and just in general coming into the reception with all the lights and neons blaring in your face when you're just coming down from a crazy you know 12 hours on a dance floor somewhere it can be a bit much but that might be the only way to kind of go with things so that's been a little bit annoying but you know it kind of is what it is but one thing i did see that was really surprising that kind of you know also surprising but reaffirmed why i live where i live is that i absolutely detest hipsters like i think i purposely went out of my way to not be around them and i'm so glad that's the case because when i was you know looking for places to go and stay or when i was kind of walking around trying to find my bearings and trying to kind of you know figure out where i was gonna go i kind of walked around the hackney area and i'd say like the clapton area the homerton area which i would kind of describe as the trendier part of east london the place where you kind of go you know if you were going to start a family the place where maybe you want to go where it's kind of closer to all your friends the place where you want to go maybe it's kind of closer to your workplace and your studio and bloody blah 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 and i saw more solomons and or salomons whatever however you fucking pronounce them than i've ever seen in my entire life and i also saw shock horror i saw one of the most craziest things i've ever seen i went to one of those kind of like mini supermarkets like a sainsbury's uh, no i went to like a mini supermarket that we have in london like a tesco express but it's a sainsbury's version i forgot what they're called and i was in there getting my coffee which is absolutely horrendous from the costa machine and a couple of croissants for breakfast and as i was walking around um you know i bumped into some lady who was a young mum, maybe looked in her early 30s, if not late 20s, with a fucking stroller and a baby, and she was wearing, guess what? She was wearing the Palace at McDonald's fucking collection. Can you imagine a young mum just giving birth to a fucking beautiful baby out there in fucking, you know, wherever that part of fucking Hackney that I was in, enjoying life, living free, doing the thing that she needs to do. And she's out here legitimately, without irony, wearing Palace and McDonald's merch. I couldn't believe it. I've seen this stuff online. And as you can see on, hip, on Hypebeast, it says a, it's a capsule collection that they made. And I honestly couldn't understand why anybody would purchase this shit. It's basically a palace merch with uh, fucking McDonald's 
M on it, you know, if you're not watching it, you'd basically kind of know what it kind of looks like. And to me, it's fucking horrid. And if anything, sort of represents just how far um, Palace has fallen over the years, which has been kind of great to see, to be fair. Do you know what I mean? Because the people behind it, you know, unfortunately, from my own personal experience, have been wankers. So it's kind of good to see them kind of go through this fucking shit. But it's also funny to see that, you know, back in the day when I was on some skate forums, the way these guys used to kind of gather around and kind of collectively try and protect Palace and the people that were, you know, founded them and a part of their team because they were all legit and they were all, you know, they all kind of came from the right stock and they were all a part of the same right scene. And essentially Palace has sold out quicker than any other brand I've ever seen in my entire life. As soon as the money started to come in, the offers for collaborations and placements and whatever it may be, they sold out so quick. They did not bat an eyelid to kind of, you know, secure the bag as quickly as possible. There was no real care of kind of protecting skateboarding, you know, maintaining the integrity of skateboarding or being core or whatever else these fucking numbnuts talk about. They went fully deep and decided to fucking sell out and when i was in fucking sainsbury's buying my croissant and my shitty machine made coffee and i bumped into that young mum wearing this palace mcdonald's merch without irony pushing her little baby around that store i legitimately questioned my life choices i was like oh my god imagine being that person and thinking that is somehow appropriate you're seeing imagine being a baby seeing your mom put on a fucking mcdonald's and palace t-shirt and thinking about hey what can i do to get out of here can i put myself up for adoption can i actually run away like what is actually going on here and i'm thinking to myself like this sort of stuff usually when you see people wearing it out and about my usual kind of gut feeling is that they're usually people who maybe are associated with the brand maybe they are um influencers in their own way maybe they got it seeded because they're friends and family maybe they got it discounted because they're friends and family maybe they are friends and family and partners of them but then there's also the crushing realization that she might have actually purchased this and i think that she was wearing a white one if i'm not actually you know what i think she might be wearing a long sleeve I'm not too sure if they exist because I don't see them in the collection here. We only have t-shirts. But I think she had a long sleeve on. Either she had a long sleeve or she went even further and bought the white t-shirt and then put a long sleeve underneath it. But either way, I saw a young mum, you know, with a baby stroller in Sainsbury's wearing Palace and McDonald's merch and I legitimately wanted to run into the nearest wall. And you can only see that when you walk around the hipster part of fucking London. Certain parts of London you go around, you all you'll see is panda dunks. Then suddenly you go to another part, all you see is Padmore Barn shoes, Clark's Wallabies, Solomons, Dr. Martins, um, you know, um, tassel loafers, Reeboks with white socks. Like it's just pretty crazy to see the amount of hipstery people walking around. And then you also have the people who legitimately wear clothes and think it kind of gives them an attitude. It kind of makes them feel cooler. One particular person that I kind of bumped into was at Sainsbury's, that same one I'm talking about, the next day when I went to go buy some water because unfortunately the Airbnb that I was in was, you know, it kind of felt like a trap. So I didn't really trust the tap water. So if we know what, well, let me actually go buy a couple of bottles of bottled water. I went in there, bought some bottled water for myself and a couple of cans of Cronenberg because why the fuck not? Went to the self-checkout machine and obviously when you scan your beer you get the little warning sign that says hey you need to have someone come over to check your id and shit and then you know the person saw the sign or the signal above our till my till and then the guy next to me and she buzzed for help and it's a mini sainsbury's so usually at most there might be like three employees there maybe five but when it gets busy it's like a flash busy so it gets busy for like 20 minutes and it kind of dies down so i'm assuming the people that work they kind of you know just kind of know how to move around the space don't really panic when it gets too busy because i know after 20 minutes it's going to die down either way sometimes shit happens one person goes on lunch one person's out doing the, having a the piss they're not around so the moment was buzzing a couple of times no one was coming and usually when i'm in those stores i just let the time be what it is i don't rush i don't get crazy because we're in a small store there's a lot of people in here all trying to get their own things. There's not a lot of staff. You just can't be guaranteed to get top level service. I just kind of surrender myself to the occasion. The guy next to me wasn't feeling that way. He wanted to make sure somebody came to him and helped him out because he had places to go. And then I looked at him. He was wearing a fucking Stussy t-shirt. He had loads of stupid clip art tattoos everywhere. 
um, you know, whatever, some sort of trendy trainer and shit. And he just was looking a bit angsty and kind of having a bit of an attitude. And he started talking to a woman. Oh, why is anyone coming to a tear? When are they going to come? This is crazy. Uh, I've been waiting for ages. Have you really actually ring the bell? Have you actually ring the bell? The woman's like, yeah, I've rang the bell. Anyway, eventually the guy does come. And as they do, when they do come along, obviously he's kind of waddling along very slow. And he's in no rush. Doesn't really give a fuck. And then I kind of just diffuse the situation. I kind of smile at him. He smiles back. And then he kind of wants to come straight across to me. But then I'm like, nah, don't worry. Don't worry about me, brother. Go to that guy there. He's in the rush, right? Go to him. I didn't say he's in a rush, but I said, go to him first. And usually polite people, would, when someone does that, will be like, oh, thank you. All right? You don't need that acknowledgement. But usually a polite person, well-mannered person, a person that's been brought up well, a person that's not up their own ass, a person who doesn't think because they take fucking 35 millimeter pictures of their friends on the weekend at their Jürgen Teller would be a bit chill and be like, hey, thank you, guy. But this guy didn't. He just acted like I wasn't there, acted like he didn't hear me, and just continued scanning his shit. The guy helped him out, then came over to me, you know, gave me my pass for my little Cronenbergs, my little room temperature Cronenbergs, and then sent me on my way. And the guy made no eye contact, kept his head down at the till, and just looking all stern and upset and angry and hipstery. And I was looking at him thinking, like, what an absolute mug. What an absolute muppet. And what a reminder of why I don't live in a hipster part of East London. And as much as it's been probably a detriment to my social life that I'm not in and amongst things. I'm not in and amongst the people that I've kind of known over the years, in and amongst the burgeoning scene, just, you know, in the thick of the action. It's also kind of nice to sort of like step away from that sort of place and come back to an area that's completely disconnected to that sort of stuff where you can kind of meet actual real people, actual normal, quote unquote, regular civilians who don't care about the shoes you wear, who don't care about where you work, who don't care if you can name, you know, if you can name all the collections of fucking Junior Watanabe from fucking 1999 to 2004. They don't give a fuck about that shit. They just care about whether or not you're a decent person. Will you get the rounds in? do you have good banter what team do you support and all of that malarkey that's all they fucking care about and i fucking love it i absolutely do um on that remark talking about stuff that i love i was recently just double checking stuff because i remember uploading this clip on my channel a while back it's just something to kind of check myself because i've been on this kind of weird little tip where i kind of am feeling like i want to start dancing again I know, crazy to say this, but I was a little bit of a dancer back in the day, right? I was a little bit of a dancer in my youth. And, um, you know, I took part in talent shows. I did loads of talent shows when I was younger, doing Michael Jackson routines. I did a bit of dancing in secondary school, break dancing shit. But then I got a bit annoyed with the classes and whatnot. Then I started to do stuff at home and just watching fucking, you know, um, you know, I forgot what that movie with Turbo is in, breakdancing movies and just kind of breakdancing videos, popping locking stuff online and just sort of like kind of learning that shit at home, learning how to wave, all that sort of stuff, right? I'm into it, right? I love to dance. And I was thinking a little bit to get into kind of a little bit more choreograph, 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 choreographied or choreography type of dancing, whatever that is called, um, where you kind of do more stuff based on learning the particular steps in a particular music video and what shit. And that was kind of came to me because of all the new little dancing or dance moves that have kind of come around certain genres, like I'm a piano, like um, loads of other things like Afro House and whatnot. And obviously now with Pirate, they now have or they've always had rehearsal spaces basically dance spaces with massive mirrors and an aux cable you can plug in your phone or your laptop to kind of play your tunes through the speakers and you can dance your heart away um in those sort of spaces for however much they pay they charge per hour and then obviously the troy sivan song came out rush right and the choreography in that video it's so fucking amazing that it legitimately made me think, you know what? I need to get back into dancing like for real, for real. I'm going to play a bit of it for you now so you can kind of see what I mean. But I legitimately think the choreography for this fucking thing is legitimately one of the best things I've ever, 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 ever seen. And I really, 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 truly want to get back into dancing like ASAP. No fucking cap. And I think when you, once you see this video, you might fucking understand why I actually feel that way. Let me see if I can play it. Bear with me one second here. Ba, 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 ba. There we go. Let's just do that. 
Yeah. So you'll see why why I mean I actually want to do this because I honestly feel like this might be one of the greatest things that I've ever seen in a very, very long time. So this is Troy Sivan's choreography for his video. Sorry, his music video. <clears throat> so this is Troy Sivan's music choreo. So this is the choreography to Troy Sivan's single Rush, which is obviously going to be in his up and coming album. I think that comes out in August or September, somewhere, somewhere along the line of that. And it's fucking incredible. I absolutely love it. And there's been a lot of conversation around this music video itself um, because of the skinny, slim, twink nature of the dancers. But if you know anything about the sort of vibe of the place that he's sort of representing and highlighting in this video with it being kind of, you know, the golden era of Berlin, maybe around the year, the month, the years of like 2002 to 2015 or something or 2017, it kind of reminds me of um grease muller back in the day of cocktail de amour it's got a lot of that kind of um, wolfgang tillsman's um, photography type of feel towards it um you know in terms of him capturing um men in this scene young men in this kind of berlin scene and what they look like and their athletic bodies and how slender they were and how they can manipulate their bodies in certain ways it's fucking incredible i absolutely love everything about it but i thought the choreography was really cool and it kind of got me inspired to kind of dance again so let me play it for you so you can see what i mean absolutely love it right i fucking love it i fucking i'm all over it and i'll fucking love to learn that type of choreography and just sort of bust out those moves at fucking carnival or some shit or at box park or my one just fucking chilling as the song kind of plays over the fucking sound system but it's definitely something that i'm kind of looking to explore going forward because in general in general anyway i've kind of come to the point where i'm sort of trying to get to the place where i fully embrace who I am and I fully embrace the things I'm into and I show it off because I have a part of me that's very modest that's very humble that doesn't like to brag and show off the things I kind of do and I'm into I kind of like to just enjoy them in the privacy of my own enjoyment if that makes any type of sense for instance the weekends i go away to various places around europe sometimes i don't even talk about them on here i won't even take pictures i won't share anything online no instagram so it's just something that i kind of want to do myself but then i sometimes think <coughs> it doesn't necessarily hold true to what i'm about because it's kind of like me purposely hiding these sort of things because i don't like the signal it kind of gives for instance a good one is the reading I read a lot of books sometimes you know I try to get through you know flipping four books a month sometimes more than that this year has not been the greatest year for my reading even though I set a goal of reading 100 books I'm nowhere close to hitting that but I do read a lot and when I used to read a lot especially when I used to read through 100 or sometimes sorry five books four books per month I'd post the books I was reading on Instagram as sort of just documentation of kind of what I'm into and I always used to kind of feel that it was kind of me it kind of also looked like I was you know um, intellectually masturbating myself right I was kind of jacking myself off um, in a sense by bragging about the things that I was reading and essentially going like oh look at me look at me look how smart I am I'm reading a book you guys are out here drinking whatever doing crazy shit and I'm actually here you know improving my life making myself smarter informing myself and blah de, blah 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 that's what I kind of felt like so I kind of felt a bit bad about doing so but then another part of me felt to thought to myself you know what I spent a large chunk of my life <coughs> especially when I was younger documenting all of my crazy debauched kind of activities outside i'd go out from like further to sunday and back then there wasn't instagram stories but essentially i'd use my feed like an open diary and i'd upload everything on today it was actually kind of nauseating there'll be pictures of me just sitting down on a table with a fucking warm pint of beer on the table and i'd post that on my instagram thinking i was cool thinking i was doing something amazing i'd post a nondescript picture of a book or a bible with some fucking lines cutting into it thinking i was edgy and shit it was really fucking cringy and really kind of embarrassing but in my opinion 
I don't think there's anything different in terms of being the person who kind of talks about all the parties you go to and documenting all of that on social media to look cool um, and to kind of look like you're you have you know cool and interesting hobbies and you're part of a little scene and shit. It's probably the opposite of someone that just posts the books that they're into, um, going for walks, nice little cultural visits they go to, exhibitions they kind of attend, plays they go and watch, readings they go to. There's nothing really different to it. It doesn't really make any sense why I would think one thing is better than the other. So now I'm in a mind where I'm thinking, no, let's embrace it. Let's put it all out there. Let's put the fact that I train most of the time, twice a day. Let's put the fact that sometimes I'm going on long runs, long bike rides. I'm going to these private views. I'm attending these fucking gallery exhibitions. I'm going to these plays. You know, I'm trying to dance. I'm trying to skateboard again. I'm learning languages. Let's actually embrace and put it all out there because I actually think that's maybe a better representation of actually who i am than trying to appear to be this kind of druggy clubby guy which i'm just not unfortunately i wish i was but unfortunately i'm not i'm realizing now that my life has kind of maybe changed and i need to fill it or kind of you know not fill it i need to sort of like push all the other stuff that i was doing to the forefront and have the other thing as something that i can kind of do here and there but i'm now coming to a point where i'm feeling a lot more comfortable about sharing that so if you do start seeing me suddenly posting loads of things that make me look smart online don't be alarmed i'm not going through a fucking crisis i'm not trying to prove anything to anybody i'm just legitimately showcasing the things that i'm into the things i'm doing so that i'm a little bit more congruent online with how i represent myself and i think that's maybe the best way to kind of go about it that's just where i'm standing but you guys could you know see it and think of something else so it kind of is what it is let me know what you think in the chat or let me know what you think in the comments actually when i do upload this later on down the line then i was also thinking about this I've just been re-watching these clips and I've kind of got a little compilation video put together of Fresh and Fit and them announcing that they've been demonetized on YouTube, which is still big news on my side of the internet because of how big they were and because of how successful their platform had become over the years. It's kind of wild to see that everything is kind of falling apart now in sort of like real time for them, right? It's kind of wild to see this kind of play out the way it's sort of playing out for them so you know on one side i kind of feel bad for them but i think on the other side if you're a sensible person you kind of knew this day was going to come somewhere along the line but anyway with that being said a part of me now thinks having watched some of these video bits and pieces and i'm going to play this content for you now a part of me is thinking to myself like when will we ever reach a point in life or in culture where we just let people be so for instance you know, you might not agree with Fresh and Fit. You might not agree with what they say. You might not agree with how they approach certain subject matters. You might not agree with how they treat women, black women, people from marginalized, com marginalized communities, minorities, whatever it may be. You may not like their rhetoric. You may think they're harmful. But by and large, if you're not a fan of theirs, you probably will never and have never watched anything that they did. You just maybe see clips and that's about it. So I'm wondering when will we get to a point in culture where we just let people be we don't agree with what they say we just say all right you're a fucking idiot we make it known why we think they're idiots and we just let them be because we're never going to be into their co content they're not making content for us but they definitely do have a fan base that enjoys what they do so why not just let them be and let the fans enjoy what they want from them and let the people that don't like them the quote-unquote haters hate in their side of the internet why does it have to be when the haters don't like you or when you're not fucking agreeable to the mass public that that means that you then get deplatformed or that your monetization gets taken away from you? I want you to kind of rest with that thought on the back of your head and I'm going to say some more after I play this little clip. As you guys know, we had a show scheduled earlier with, um, Psych with Psych Hacks, but we had to uh, cancel because we got some really, uh, you know, sucky news um crazy news yeah crazy news real talk yeah is this the end bro because uh <laughs> we got some bad news man uh i mean when i heard i was i was shocked because i mean we love youtube man yeah we love streaming yeah and um at this point i feel like our whole lives are revolved around streaming and like yeah adding value to, to you know people online it's just like it won't be the same bro yeah it sucks guys it really does suck um you know fortunately we you know we made some 
moves, etc. You know, and we kind of saw knew that the type of content that we make for us to be able to give you this content, we have to it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost, dude. and it won't be here forever. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we you know, know Fresh always it. said this, you know, enjoy us while you can. <laughs> yeah. Uh they thought we was capping, man. Yeah. They thought it was a joke. And and you know, we did we made moves on the side knowing that this could potentially happen. And guys, we, we the channel has been kicked off the YouTube partner program. Just keep it straight with you. If you look right now, you can't even super chat or you can't remember. even super chat right now. Brutal. Yep. Uh, so this is the beginning of the end of this era. Hello, it's funny how the Jews who control Instagram, the girls are getting more naked for these random people who just going on here. <laughs> <laughs> we have the bags. We got the media. He's gonna be canceled by yes. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I've already uh, contacted Adia. Don't love the Muslim. Love us. We control everything. Jesus oh, fuck. Christ. That bitch is a liar. Ashy you, ugly ass Jewish bitch. You know what is the gas chamber part? Why did you do? You, now you do hey, all my fucking life. asshole. No. <laughs> How many times do I got to tell you're gonna get canceled for I'm that? Sorry, I'm you're sorry. the chosen people. Man. Thank you. Just, well, well, why would God with, choose five foot? Bank, you dirty uh, why, why would God choose you, five foot two people? You bank with TD, <laughs> TD Bank probably, right? You do know, man. Yeah, your account's gone. Your fucking account's gone, buddy. He's. I think he's a Jewish man. Of course, yeah. I'm not even lying. Yeah. Shut him over here. Look at this Jew. Obesity is not a good sign of good you, jeans, is it? Hey, I, I, I can't hear the synagogue of herpes. Well, did it? Obesity comes from you Jews affecting our media I'm with the your reason fucking. You're fat. No, you guys brought McDonald's and all that shit, right? Before you Jews came here, we were eating breakfast, bacon, and eggs, okay? Jesus to destroy Christ. us and to, to fuck a wall of the whale, the whaling wall. No, we're going to cancel it tomorrow. Oh, He's gone. I already told the ADL. I got the call. <laughs> hey, man. Oh, my. Y'all are getting canceled tomorrow. <laughs> Six million died. Yeah. <laughs> six million dollars for six million. million. It was exactly six million. million. Was it was not a hair no. less. What about five nine 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 nine? Is that okay? ADL's right. being notified. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Myron uh, Stein is here. Uh, Anybody need a loan, by the way? High interest rates, but I got I could hook y'all up. Oh, and I own the banks. Hey, you, Hitler, you know why I hate Hitler? Because <laughs> he didn't even kill six million. Just like Einstein, Jesus your Jew Christ. fuck said it's a motionless plane. The Earth is an observable motionless plane. I heard there was a Jew. I heard there. <laughs> Where's he? Where'd he go? I'm got no more jokes now because like Arabs didn't even do 9/11. It was the Jews. <laughs> no, remember the Jews tried to the Jews tried to convince us that Einstein is the biggest brain. Women are not built to handle masculine problems. We are being vulnerable with a woman is some of the worst advice that modern women give for men. Because if I sit there and I cry to you, oh my god, my life is hard, blah 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 blah, you might sit there and console me for a bit, but deep down, like, you fucking bitch. I left a job that I truly loved to do this, right? Because I should be admitting this, but saving children, right? That was great. Uh huh. But saving you guys is better. I bet it was. Here comes the tears. Not a single tear seen, by the way. Supposedly he cried, but where's the tears? We don't see them. <laughs> yeah, man. This is tough, bro. Because, uh, for our legend for this, you know? We didn't miss a day, honestly. Um, it's tough. We gave up so much to uh, give you guys value. So, um, you know what, Myron? You're right. I do think you're a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, you get the point, right? So my whole question is, when will we get to a point in culture where you just let people be? When will that happen? But then on the same token, you just have to come back to the point that I made in the previous live stream from the random show, where I essentially said, these guys should have seen this coming. Their content was way too divisive. Their content was way too quote unquote edgy. Their content was way too against the popular narrative, was way too against what most of YouTube stands for, which is mostly kind of favoring the left side of politics and 
culture and social issues and shit they should have been aware of that and planned accordingly or tone down the content but if you don't want to tone down the content plan accordingly and maybe have other platforms where you can go and say all that crazy shit about jews about black women about women in general about minorities about relationships about sex about whatever money go to other platforms where you can kind of say that stuff freely but I would honestly love to us to get to a point in culture where we all just say, hey, if we don't like this stuff, we just turn off and we just pay attention to the things that we love. Instead of it always being, hey, I don't like what I'm listening to. Can I get it deplatformed? It kind of, to me, feels a little bit similar to how we are in London with how crappy our club scene is here. Because essentially, <clears throat> it feels like, sorry, <clears throat> for the most part, most councils across the UK have this policy where they favour the homeowners over the club owners. For instance, if you open up a new club in a derelict part of London where no one really gives a shit about and you make it pop in and it now becomes a hotbed of culture and the scene and all these young cool people start to move there and start to start businesses and whatever it may be, the council will see that grant a fucking you know um a property developer permission to then build an amazing skyscraper of fucking crappy homes you know that look like glass and steel and rubbish expensive coffee shops that will then take over the places that were there and made that place cool hashtag gentrification but then sometimes even if they let the club stay there what will end up happening is that the people that moved in there quote unquote first or made that place somewhat popping will then not have any say in the long-term future of the club and that space that they're in. They will always favour the opinion of the homeowner. So if the homeowners complain and say, hey, I hate the noise, I hate all the fucking antisocial be behaviour that happens after the club is finished, they will most likely always side with the homeowner. And I feel like on in, in social media or in content generation, a lot of the moves and a lot of the fucking punishments are usually done that way where they only favor the people who don't like the content like they, if you don't like these people they most likely are going to demonetize them or deplatform them so that you don't have to hear them the same way you heard them before because i'd imagine demonetization it's never happened to me and touch would it never does but i'd imagine it probably does a lot of harm to your channel because it probably takes you out of the algorithm. It probably stops you getting recommended if you can't get monetized because if you can't get monetized, YouTube can't get anything out of your channel. So why would they push you in their kind of algorithm feed or whatever it may be? It doesn't really make any sense. And you might even get kind of, and we already know, um, you know, we already know sort of like back end, sort of like black marking a channel and what, I forgot what the term of it. We actually know that stuff exists. If you work in social media companies or if you to startups you know there's always a back end where you can essentially mark a user as like not safe and not maybe promote their stuff on the main page and there'll be none the wiser that that's been done so you can imagine the kind of damage demonetization can do to a channel that kind of relies on virality relies on always being a part of the public conversation can do to a channel like fresh and fit but like i said before they should have seen this coming and this wasn't that big of a surprise if you were really paying attention to stuff that was going on social media but i think these guys legitimately had their head in the sand and now they are suffering for it next on this i want to talk about this dylan dennis has been on a bit of a tear terrorizing logan paul and his soon-to-be wife nina and i don't understand it i get it from the sense of trolling i think it's an amazing way to troll somebody for an up-and-coming boxing fight if you don't know who dylan dennis is he's a well-known well-regarded jujitsu practitioner but over the years has kind of fell you know out of favor with a lot of mma and ufc fans because you know of his kind of um because of how much I guess he used to suck up to Conor McGregor because he was a big part of his kind of contingents, con you know, kind of click and the beef we had with Khabib and then not following through on some of the fights and, you know, talking a lot of smack but not actually following through with the, you know, with actually going in the ring and defending. So next thing I want to talk about is Dylan Dallas versus Logan Paul. I'm a little bit confused by this because I think in general, this really does illustrate just how little I understand about this new 
wave or this new perspective that some men have about women on social media it's kind of been gnarly to see it play out in real time so if you haven't been paying attention dylan dennis who is a jiu-jitsu champion and a black belt and a badass in his own regard is now gonna face logan paul in an up-and-coming boxing match and um or boxing fight sorry and the whole sort of build up towards it is that Logan and Dennis and Dylan Dennis don't get on that much. And Dylan Dennis in an effort to kind of troll and to promote the fight has been uploading all of these random pictures of Logan Paul's soon to be wife, Nina, with loads of random men. And if you look at a lot of these pictures, a lot of these pictures kind of feature um, Logan Paul's soon to be wife just standing next to dudes. So you don't actually know what this actually means does it mean that because she's standing next to this guy that she slept with him or does it mean that all of these guys that she was stood next to she was somehow romantically involved with or sexually involved with back in the day whatever it may be it's become like a running troll um on logan and i guess logan hasn't helped things because essentially if i'm not mistaken he might have sent dylan dallas a cease and desist he might have blocked dylan dennis there's been a lot of kind of you know i'm not really sure how to kind of read everything that's happened but essentially you know logan hasn't been too pleased about how dylan has been kind of going non-stop at his soon-to-be wife <clears throat> and what we basically seen online is a lot of people interpreting that most likely Dil you know logan paul's wife may have been romantically or sexually involved with a lot of these guys that she's been pictured with over the years and don't get me wrong the girl's only maybe i guess in her late 20s or early 30s it is a bit alarming to see how many guys that she legitimately has been around but when you consider that she was a victoria's secret model considering that she's conventionally attractive she's blonde she's skinny um, she's good looking it doesn't really make it's not that surprising that she would always be in the company of men because women that look like that should always be in the company of men especially rich and famous men who can pay their way who can show them a particular type of lifestyle who just want to have a pretty girl next to them i'm sure those type of dudes exist guys with money who just want to have hot girls around them just because it looks cool and it looks swaggy to be surrounded or to be next to a hot girl as it does you know compared to you being around all these kind of sweaty dudes so that kind of makes a lot of sense but i guess if you believe the narrative that every guy that she's picked up with she's fucked and you're a kind of dude who has this vision of women that you know if they're not virgins that they're basically useless it can kind of be a bit funny to see dylan dennis go so crazy on nina and logan but i can't really understand it i don't really understand it because i basically live in the real world and the real world dictates to me that if i find somebody attractive most likely other people will find that person attractive too whether it's the you know them physically being attractive whether it's their personality being very attractive i'm sure attractive people get attention from a lot of people so if that's the case then it leads me to believe that most likely this person's been involved with other people somewhere along their life somewhere down the line right we would all kind of agree with that so if that's the case why is everyone bothering why is everyone stressing that you know that she may have had several boyfriends in the past that should be of no surprise if she is a former Victoria's Secret model, blonde and, you know, conventionally attractive. It makes absolutely no sense why that wouldn't make sense. Don't get me wrong. Some of the videos of her speaking about, you know, her sexual exploits, you know, back in the day on interview shows is a bit funny, especially if you're somebody that had recently proposed to her. But if I'm somebody looking at this from the outside in, I'm more concerned or it makes me laugh way more that Logan Paul allegedly uh, proposed to this woman um, with a half a million diamond ring, um, sorry, engagement ring, but then he still hasn't refunded the guys from CryptoZoo. The kids that he fucking scammed at CryptoZoo where he only owes them 1.5 million. I say only because, you know, Logan's got that. Not to pocket wash the guy, but he has 1.5 million to make that right. And he promised he would do this again. The thing about this promise that he gave to these guys who invested in CryptoZoo, he said from his own mouth after CoffeeZilla hounded him, after being embarrassed online and shit and doing those cringy response videos and shit, he said from his own mouth that he would make it right and refund these guys 1.5 million. And he refuses to do so. He wants to fly his girlfriend out to these amazing locations to do a 
really romantic proposal, give her an engagement ring that allegedly may have cost half a million, plan probably a very expensive wedding, talk about a very expensive honeymoon, and then tell his girlfriend to shut the fuck up on the podcast when she was speaking about it. All of the stuff that you would assume costs a lot of money, but then refuses to spend 1.5 million to make it right to the people that he alleged legitimately had scammed. That for me is way more egregious than the possibility that Logan Paul may have married a girl that people class as being a slut or class as being a whore. Who gives a fucking fuck? Like, really, who honestly cares about this stuff? I really don't. I more care about the fact that he has legitimately, you know, um, come to a place where he has refused repeatedly to refund these guys from CryptoZoo and give them their money back when he could easily, in my opinion, easily pay back the 1.5 million. Like, easily pay back the 1.5 million, but he refuses to. But more people are sitting here legitimately, genuinely upset that he may have married somebody that might be a flipping, um, you know, might be someone that people class as being a whore, a slag, a slut, or whatever it may be. I just think that is really naive, really immature to think somebody that is in their mid 20s or a late 30s or early 30s whatever it may be and that looks the way that she does is going to be in pure to the point where you're going to meet her and she only has had one or two sexual partners it doesn't make any fucking sense personally for me but we live in a world and society where men legitimately are sitting there thinking that the more att again that's the thing is crazy it might be one thing if you're into the girl next door vibe right and you find out that she's got 1000 bodies fair enough you might have to have a little fucking you know question and answer section with the god upstairs about whether or not you should propose to the person but if you're going after women who are legitimately attractive and other men legitimately like and let's be honest most men on this earth especially white men love a blonde woman so if that's the case why would you think a woman that looks like that would have no prior sexual relations with, with people? Like, what makes you legitimately think? What gives you that entitlement? What makes you so arrogant to think that you would be the first person to ever touch her? It doesn't make any sense when she is desirable to all men, right? If you got money, if you don't have money, whatever it may be, I'm sure there's guys and kids out there who are fucking cut her pictures up out of fucking Sports Illustrated or Victoria's Secret model catalogs and stuck them on their wall. She's probably on the wall of fucking prisons across the United States and parts of the fucking globe. So to think that no other guy has imagined jacking off on her or has had the opportunity to bust inside of her is absolutely ridiculous. So that's why I don't honestly understand this troll. But for Logan, it's worked because unfortunately he has responded in a sensitive manner. And now once you respond that way, it's almost impossible, almost impossible for you not to look like your butt hurt and the troll never stops. That's the issue with trolling. Once you let people know what hurts your feelings, once you let them know, oh, this is out of bounds, you have to be respectful, you start doing all that pussy shit, people are never going to stop. So now that the people realize that, they're going to keep going. But the one thing that I did realize over the time of this trolling, which I didn't know realize before, she's one of the girls that Leonardo DiCaprio has dated over the years. Not Leo has a thing about models and about dating models of a certain age. She's one of those models. I didn't know this because I'm not plugged into the Victoria's Secret fashion model scene and what they're all about and stuff but i found out through this trolling that she is one of leonardo dicaprio's exes which i think is quite swaggy i think that'd be quite swaggy to be a fucking you know an eskimo brother with fucking leonardo dicaprio that mean, must mean you're operating and moving in some fucking elite circles but maybe i'm you know in the i'm i'm the one that's an idiot here and maybe all these guys who are out here you know preaching the prophecy of being alpha are legitimately only knocking down, you know, um, super hot blondes that all also happen to be fucking virgins, which is insane. Unless they go to a church, it's not going to happen, really. And even if they are in a church, most likely the, the the male parts go into the other holes. And if you know what I mean, you know what I mean. But it's been quite funny to fucking see this play out. The troll has been quite amazing because it feels like there's been a non-stop amount of pictures that's the funny part about it like she has so many pictures online with her and dudes but i guess again like i said being a fucking victoria's secret model um being very attractive you're always gonna have men after you and if you don't mind hanging out with dudes and taking their money and enjoying their fucking company then you're gonna have a lot of pictures with them but i think when you just put them into order and you have them posted up online it looks crazy but i think overall 
I don't give a fuck. So I'd love to know what you guys think. Um, if you do end up watching this clip later on, what do you think about this whole affair? Would would you be bothered if you were Leon, sorry, Leon, if you're Logan Paul and you saw these images of your soon-to-be wife with all these random dudes that maybe you weren't aware of, would it really bother you? Did you know about this prior? Um, is this an issue? Let me know down below in the subject, you know, in the fucking comments if you can. And I'd love to know if you honestly think former Victoria's Secret models should also be expected to be fucking... Um, virgins let me know why you think that or just let me know why in general you think if a girl has more than fucking five bodies that it basically means that she's a fucking prostitute please tell me in the comments down below why you think that because i would love to know some of these perspectives because i'm sure i'm probably missing a mark and i'm sure there'll be a con contingents of people out there who legitimately think i'm a simp which is fucking hilarious because i don't give a fuck about this girl she's not my type i wouldn't be into it in the slightest <coughs> but i'm sure some guys will think that i'm being a horror apologist and a simp in some regard so i'm eager to see and hear the opinions of you other guys when you do get into the comments and let me know what you think i'm eager to hear what you guys think moving on from that moving on from that lovely subject we have to talk about this quickly this has been a really funny video to watch because it's kind of popped up on my algorithm randomly. So big up YouTube for actually having an algorithm that actually works because I feel like it's improved over the years or it's improved over the last few months. I'm now being recommended random videos from accounts that have like 22 subscribers and four views, which is incredible because it means now they are pushing organically content from small creators so that they can maybe sometime along the line become bigger so it's been great to see so this particular video came across my timeline and it's very you know pertinent to kind of my point of view and how i approach life by the title alone and the title is i'm 25 and i have no friends i'm just going to play a little bit of the intro and then i'm going to give you a little bit of my opinion and why i think if you're 25 and you have no friends you should try it actively and with um, a lot of kind of force and a lot of due diligence and a lot of effort you should go out of your way to try and make friends because if you keep having this sort of mindset as the years progress it gets harder and harder and you might get to a point where you start regretting not making that extra bit of effort to make at least one good friend because i think life without any friends is really not a life worth living but let me play the clip here for you so it's your boy let him know so I'm back with another video as you can see by the title i which i think is pretty self-explanatory i am 25 and i have no friends now i think that um as we all age and we all grow up and we have different things going on in life i do feel that to some degree, it's natural for people to grow apart. But I don't really think it's normal for people to kind of feel like they don't have any friends at all. Personally, um, throughout my life up to this point, I, I've definitely had many, many friendships um, many people I've been cool with, close with, um, who we shared common interests and goals and different things like that. But uh, over the years, it just seems like they all kind of like gradually just like fell away from me or like we grew apart or whatever. But um, yeah, I definitely had a lot of people who I've been close with since like elementary school, through middle school, high school, college. Um, yeah. So high school, I... Anyway, you get the point of what he's trying to say. So what I'm trying to say when it comes to sort of stuff, like I've had similar sort of feelings and I've spoken about my lack of friendships in general on this podcast many, 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 many a times. And I feel like I've got to a point where I'm kind of understanding and accepting of my personality and about how I kind of do things. But I also think when you're young, I think you should really try your best to at least have one or two good friends. 
I think it can be really difficult in the scenes or in the kind of neighborhoods or in the places that you kind of grow up because sometimes you're only limited to the people around you or if you don't have an ability to travel or to go to different places or to have different experiences it can also be hard to sort of expand your friendship group in that regard and even sometimes the internet as great as that is that isn't really going to replace actually having friends that you could actually meet up with in real life and you know whatever it may be and hang out and talk and share some good times with it can be really difficult to kind of get a handle on it but i think it's really imperative it's really important to try your best over the years especially while you're young especially while loads of different people are coming in and out of your life to maybe hold on to a couple and not let them go and what ends up happening i think when you're young is that you have a lot of people coming in and out of your life but i think it really is on you the onus is on you to make the effort to really build maintain cultivate and take that relationship to the next level so that that person knows hey no this person actually wants to be my friend friend they feel the love they feel you fucking reaching out they they feel appreciated they feel seen they feel acknowledged and most likely nine times out of ten they're gonna they're gonna reciprocate that and then you guys are gonna click and you're gonna take it to the next level what i've noticed with my life over the years is that usually i have all these people coming in and out of my life but i made no effort to really pull them closer to me and make the relationship take the relationship to the next level I never did that. I just enjoyed the person at the place or at the time that I met them. That was all it was. And then I kind of just let it be. There was no follow-up. There was no um, check-in. There was no, you know, being there for that person when they needed. There was no attending of birthday dinners, birthday parties, weddings, um, baby showers, all this sort of stuff that usually allows you to put the building blocks in building blocks of a long-term relationship in place i never did so now uh, down the line in my life where i'm a little bit older and i'm now kind of going on my instagram and seeing all these people that i kind of knew who have now kind of moved on with their life and they're doing great things and they're maybe having weddings and not inviting me and stuff i can't take that too personally or i can't feel too bad about that because i've made no effort to cultivate that relationship along the along the way or along the years i did nothing to do so so i think it's important to try and do that when you're really young because when you're older it becomes harder to do that because you're kind of ingrained or you're sort of like you're stuck in a bit you're a bit you're a bit stuck in your ways and you also build up this little self-narrative this little self-talk thing that sort of like helps you justify your shitty actions and i think i have a tendency to do that i think the fact that i talk about oh i don't have many friends i'll keep myself to myself it's sort of like a way for me to sort of not deal with the fact that i don't really do well with commitment and to not deal with the fact that i don't like to be accountable to people and to deal with the fact that i don't like to get close to people because maybe i've been hurt in the past or maybe because i feel vulnerable and i don't want to feel vulnerable or because i don't like what it maybe does to my time or or i'm maybe selfish with my time or selfish overall whatever it is i'm sure that i kind of do that and i sort of like justify it by saying that i'm just on my own i'm a lone soldier i'm alone i'm a lone wolf when really and truly i would obviously love more friends but now i'm at a point in my life where i'm so used to the way that i act and most likely i'm not going to change because i've got other little things and you know stuff built in on me that kind of makes it hard to kind of break those things down and it just becomes a little bit harder when you're older so i think you should try and correct that when you're fucking young and it's really kind of a bit of a trip because i'm thinking back to a time when i was promoting parties when i was djing a lot in trendier parts of east london when i was working in that nike store when i was working at fucking depop and shit where legitimately i felt like i was in like the center of everything right everyone was sort of coming to me for things because i had a cool job because i was around cool people because access to cool things because i could give them something because i was djing because i was throwing my own party because i had all the drugs because i was giving away all the free drink tokens i was letting people in for free all these things were fucking amazing right i was meeting them at the door to bring them a head to make them jump the queue all these things were great because i was that main person but then looking at it nowadays all of those people that were kind of in my orbit surrounding me sort of like sucking me off patting me on the back and making me feel good are nowhere to be found 
But the funny thing about it, they're still hanging around with the same people that were they were hanging around with back in the day. Some of them have moved on and actually decided to kind of, you know, wipe their hands away of that kind of lifestyle, which has been amazing. Big up my guy, Tom Courtney Clack, who I actually spoke to for a little bit on the DMs. Um, he completely, you know, moved away from that whole scene, is living somewhere amazing, surrounded by plants and trees and greenery and loads of cute little children and people with big, happy smiles and whatever it may be. He's actually living a, a, a completely different life. But there are other people who I know who are still part of the scene who I don't talk to at all, have no communication with, who are still hanging around those people that they hang around with because they've got a mutually beneficial relationship, which I also feel like when I was younger, I looked down upon I had a lot of bitterness towards because I knew how fake it was. But I don't, but now I'm older, I don't think it's an issue. I don't think it's an issue. I don't think it's a bad thing to only be surrounded by quote unquote cool friends because they make your life easier or because that they, you know, it's a mutual beneficial relationship. For instance, if you have a brand and you happen to know a very famous artist or if you're a photographer and you know a really hot girl, it's okay for you guys to be only friends because you're a famous photographer and that model knows that if she takes pictures with you, you might help to boost her profile, you might help her get more jobs, you might get her more followers. And a photographer also knows hanging around with a beautiful girl that you're going to make him look like beautiful girls like to hang around with him, you're going to make him look professional, you're going to help you're going to you're going to help him take good pictures and shit. That mutual beneficial relationship which I used to look down upon and used to think oh that's fake because none of you guys know each other's mum's names and shit. That's not real friendship. I now look at it and think, no, that's actually what friendships are in a way. There is a form of friendship that does exist that's like that, where you kind of are only friends with people because they are they live in your sort of world. Um, they operate within your little um, subculture and they are so more beneficial to the things that you do and you kind of scratch his back and they scratch your back there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever and I feel like when you're young you should try to cultivate those relationships and kind of double down and try to find those friends in that scene because once you get older it becomes really difficult to put your ego and your pride to one side and try to be that person's friend when you have nothing to offer them because they're going to make you know that you have nothing to offer they're going to remind you of how cool uncool you are so if you want to not give yourself a heart attack and if you don't want to make yourself feel angry and want to want to punch the wall i think it's important to try and suck up to people while you're young and you have no pride you have no achievements you have nothing to kind of you know uh, make you feel entitled or to make you feel like you deserve more or to make you feel like you don't you should you're, be you're better than groveling you should try to do that when you're young because i guarantee you when you get older it becomes near on impossible to be the guy that's like hey man what are you guys doing over the weekend hey man do you mind putting me in the guest list hey man do you want to hang out after hey man what are you guys doing before the party hey man are you going to dinner can i come on it, it's nigh on impossible to for me to utter those words out of my lips to ask somebody for a discount to ask somebody for a hookup for this can i come to your event can you put like it's nearly impossible for his lips words to come out of my mouth and when they do come out of my mouth on some rare occasions i legitimately feel like fucking shit and most of it comes from the pride, the entitlement, the, the, you know, me feeling like I deserve that and I should be having that. And whatever all those complexes that come into place. But I feel like when you're younger, you should try to make sure that you cultivate those friends in that scene where you can. Because when you get older, it becomes incredibly hard. And just in general, apart from the scene, apart from subcultures, when you get older, people just have different responsibilities. I feel like the pandemic changed a lot of things. It sort of changed the landscape of clubbing forever, but it did change people's interests. I feel like a lot of people people who i may have bumped out bumped into in the fucking dance floor or on the dance floor sorry or at raves or just socially are now not around anymore and they've now matured they've now had babies they've now gotten married and stuff and there's a little bit of like lifestyle shaming going on in the scene where people kind of make you feel bad about the lifestyle choices you have because they decided to mature and in their eyes i understand it they see you and just see a fucking delinquent and in your eyes, when you look at them, you see an old fuddy-duddy. So you kind of, you know, you're always going to be at loggerheads. So it's kind of at a place now where there is definitely a, you know, there's definitely a split in terms of some social groups where some people are like, hey, I've moved on with my life. I don't want to be surrounded with the people that I used to do kept with. I want to have all these other new friends and other things happen also. But I also think along the lines, 
you have to kind of figure out a way to kind of deal with friendship breakups. I haven't really dealt with them that well um, over the years. I only, I haven't had many. I haven't had a couple over the last few years, which have been a bit difficult because if anything, I felt like these friendship breakups have been very clever on the other person's side because they essentially called it quits before you were able to kind of work through or talk about the issues that might have led to it getting called quits. So they were able to kind of shut the door and that kind of leave you with your words in your mouth, which is fucking frustrating. There's nothing f worse than somebody not allowing you to kind of let... No, there's something. There's nothing more frustrating than you not being able to say your piece. And most times you don't. Most times people move away. They get re into relationships. They maybe pass away. Or just things just break down to a point where you don't really feel the need to kind of talk about it. But I feel like it's important too, because I feel like if you spent time with somebody as a friend you probably owe them an explanation as to why you're not friends anymore. And you also owe them an opportunity to hear them hear them out, like actually speak, not through a DM, not through a text or whatever it may be. So when some people kind of break up with you that way and sort of like dismiss you in that regard, it maybe says more about them than it says about you. Maybe that's a coping mechanism, but it's also just very hard to take. And um, that's the only opportunity or the only, just the only time in my life I've legitimately wished death on somebody. So, you know, Corey, I fucking hope you fucking fall off a bridge one day. But that's the only times I've legitimately wished death on somebody when somebody has friendship broken up with me because I feel like I haven't had the opportunity to kind of say my piece. But I feel like a lot of that comes from the fact that I never had many friends to, to, to begin with. So when you do end up losing one or three friends and now you're left with two, it kind of makes you feel like, fuck. And then you don't get opportunity. You don't get opportunity to kind of say your piece. You also feel terrible. So to this guy and other young people out there, if you do have the opportunity to make friends while you're young, because you have many people coming in and out of your life, you're moving around, um, you're able to do loads of fun things with lot, not a lot of money. N most of you guys don't have money, haven't figured out life. You know, all that stuff is fun to discover all these things together at the young age. I think it's important and imperative to hold on to a couple of people in that group and let them know, hey, I appreciate you. I see you as a friend and kind of show up for them be there for them and just let them know that you want to take a relationship to the next level and actually make those people your friends it's super super important because somewhere along the line the older you get you're going to look back on it and regret that you didn't try and make that effort to take the relationship to the next level because i know i do because now that i'm older and i'm ingrained and i'm kind of set in my ways i don't i don't really go out of my way to try to make friends i keep my circle close i don't really like people like that um i have all my little kind of you know, um, baggages that I'm kind of carrying with myself. I find it very difficult to kind of make that step. And all of it has because of the decisions I made when I was young. And I kind of regret a little bit of that when I did it. So if you are out there and you're young and you're fucking, you know, don't have any friends and you feel like that's a cool thing to do to be on your own. No, you need friends. You need to have at least one or two people you can depend on. It doesn't mean you need people to kind of go on holiday with or whatever it may be. You can still do things on your own if you need to be. But having people that you can talk to or that you know, that fucking know you know, know you is really fucking important doesn't matter if you meet them at work if you meet them at college if you meet them playing football if you meet them at a fucking social group at church whoever wherever you meet these people hold on tight to them because when you get older and life does get in the way it can be very very difficult to make any friends let alone keep a hold of the ones you actually have so don't take it for granted then i want to talk about this this is a fucking crazy clip right it's gone kind of viral on social media of this young lady essentially complaining about the fucking sex scene in Oppenheimer. Kind of wild, right? Kind of wild to hear this because I legitimately feel the sex scene in Oppenheimer was kind of tame. Obviously, it was a bit surprising to see because Christopher Nolan has never really had, you know, full-on sex scenes. He may have had implied sex scenes here and there. I can think of the one with the magicians. There might have been a couple in there. But for the most part, he doesn't really have sex scenes in his movies. That's why it was a big deal when people found out that there was going to be a sex scene in Oppenheimer, especially considering the subject matter of the movie. But I thought the most uncomfortable part of the movie, or sort of the sex scene, wasn't actually the sex. It was more so the after sex shit where they were just sitting around on these doody doody frumpy chairs stark naked 
And if you sat on those type of chairs, you know how fucking itchy they are and un how uncomfortable they can be against your skin. So just sitting there with your balls hanging out is a little bit mad, right? Having your pussy lips all over that fucking chair doesn't make any sense to me. But it's also surprising to see people legitimately say that the sex scene made them feel uncomfortable. But it also kind of reminds me a little bit of my upbringing. So let me play a little bit of this clip for you so you can see what this person's saying. And this is kind of thing courtesy of, I think, a TikTok that they had it on but i'm gonna play the video for you now so you can hear what they say okay so i researched i researched everything before we watch it but especially this movie obviously i heard about it yes we wanted to see it it has an amazing rating um we prepared ourselves i didn't know when the scene was going to happen and i also didn't understand how the scene was happening i thought it was <laughs> just several minutes straight of but it wasn't i love that i just realized she what she doesn't even say sex she refuses to say even the word sex. I fucking love this. I love this like I love this level of modesty to be honest. It's kind of refreshing. I'm not going to lie. It was actually broken up into like it would do a, a flash of that and then it would do a flash of normal life and then it would do a flash of the scene and then it was like very, you know, back and forth. So it was really difficult to avoid it. But obviously my husband and I talk about everything. If we go anywhere or we go see anything, even if it's a concert, movie, um, an event, we have a game plan we talk about things like what if you get triggered what if i get triggered really the problem isn't what if you get triggered the problem is what if i get triggered <laughs> i don't want my night to be ruined by being triggered by something on a screen uh-huh so essentially um what we did was when the scene came up when things were happening he literally closed his eyes and laid his head on my shoulder <laughs> like this is my shoulder like, this is my shoulder <sighs> and then i would just like let him know whenever it was over and it literally, I will tell you what right now, took nothing away from the story. Him not looking at the screen during... <laughs> did not change the storyline, did not change anything. Um, have a plan and talk about it before you go. So, um, don't get me wrong. It's a little bit insane because the sex scene in Oppenheimer is very tame. But it also kind of reminds me of my upbringing, which is a fairly a very religious household very conservative and so conservative that when i was growing up living at home my parents would sometimes change the channel when we were watching an animal show and the animals were fucking mating like if it was a show and you, you know i don't know fucking david attenborough show about the fucking animals in the jungle and shit or whatever it may be and the animals started mating on screen my parents would fucking either turn away or change the channel like, it was legitimately insane how fucking, you know, um, conservative and, you know, very uh, modest they were in that regard. But I sometimes look back onto that time, sometimes and laugh and think that's fucking ridiculous. But I also think to myself, maybe that might have informed how chill I am comparative to my experience in a church because i went to a church between the ages of like no i was heavy in church heavy like going sunday and then going to fucking youth church and then going midweek i was heavy in church from what ages of probably 15 to 22 i spent every week in church every week without fail it's 15 to 22 i think about that around that time right and maybe 22 was about the first time I was probably started to go out in a scene and drink a lot and whatever, start doing drugs. And that's when I suddenly started to kind of pull away from the church and have sort of other interests. But around those type of years, I felt like because church was so, so much of my life and because I had a very kind of like chill, modest, um, non-vulgar, non-sweary type of life it also kind of gave me a good base when i did go out into the real world where i think for the most part you know sometimes people say oh if you go to a christian school or if you go to like a, if girls go to like an all catholic school they usually are super freaky because they're not allowed to do anything right i think it's how i had the opposite effect on me i think it made me chill it made me relax because i had the opportunity to kind of grow up in my sort of like you know adolescent years where i'm uh, where i had all that fucking frustration or whatever it may be it was sort of kind of tamed out of me at church so by the time i did get out into the real world when i was in my early 20s i was just enjoying whatever i was enjoying but it wasn't be it wasn't enjoying it like being thirsty because i had no opportunity to do the things i wanted to do in church because unfortunately the church i did go to it wasn't your conventional church right big up my kcc mandem but that church people go up to shit so people were able to kind of dibble and dabble in both things but i think in general because we had such a big 
um, contingency of young people in that church who came from various walks of life and shit. It kind of legitimately gave you a very good base of like, you know, of friends and ex life experiences. And it allowed you to kind of grow up without needing to grow up on the streets. By the time you get out on the streets, you've done all your growing up. You've seen most things, so nothing really surprised you. Which is weird to say because you it really should be the opposite. Church should be a safe haven where you don't need to kind of interact with the things that you see on the outside in church. But unfortunately, sometimes it can bleed into the other. And I think that kind of helped in the long term. But in this video in particular, taking this video into account, I think it's quite refreshing to have this because I saw somebody complain about it the other day. I think it was um, my girl called Seal, the DJ, online. I think that's how you pronounce her name. If it's not, I apologize. But I think it's pronounced like C-E-I-L, right, DJ? Seal, Seal, DJ. Let's see if there's a one. Yeah, that's the one, right? And I follow her on fucking social media. Big up her. She's always really funny. She has some really cool insights on DJing and whatnot. And she's played that Panorama Bar a few times. So congratulations to her. And she's got some pretty decent mixes up on Whore as well. And I remember her saying recently the other day, or just in recently over the years, um, that she gets annoyed when she logs onto Twitter sometimes and has to see, you know, a random person's pussy. Like she might follow a couple of people who are into sex work or maybe just the algorithm kind of plops certain adult materials on your feed and you just want to kind of, you know, shit post. You want to sound off on a particular news story or cultural item and here you have a full fucking sex scene on your fucking timeline. And Twitter's the worst for it because even if you don't like that stuff, it will somehow come on your timeline because for some reason, Twitter has like a very loosey-goosey approach when it comes to X-rated material. So I think in a world where there's probably too much porn online, it is quite refreshing to have people out there who legitimately have this perspective on the world, who are able to be a little bit modest, who are not that really into, you know, overt, you know, sexual acts online or in movies and shit. And they talk about it from a very logical, sensible, grown up point of view. I think it's somewhat refreshing to see that because if we're all, if we're all okay with having sex work all over social media, which it is what it is, if we're all empowering people to do what they want to do with their bodies and have full autonomy, I also think the opposite needs to exist where there is a platform, there is a space for people who don't want to see that stuff on social media, who don't want to live that sort of lifestyle. Think about that video of that woman who's friends with um, Tiny's, um, T.I.'s wife saying, you know, I'll, I'll probably put a clip in here if you haven't heard it before. We go eat together. We play with her kids together. And I do her hair. I don't know nothing about that lifestyle, whatever y'all got going on, because that's not me. But um, I think of that clip and it kind of is, it does ring true. I do think there are people out there who maybe aren't religious, who just are fed up with seeing so much sex on their timeline. So maybe when they're watching a Christopher, sorry, a Christopher Nolan movie, the last thing they want to see is sex for real. Because they have so much of it on their timeline. They legitimately think he's one of the best directors and, you know, walking on this earth right now, which I do think he is. And they usually trust him to make a really good movie that doesn't have those overt sexual scenes in it. And maybe even think about it now, because he's never had them in there, maybe there's a whole scene of people who live a modest life who maybe only watch Christopher Nolan movies because they know, by and large, you're going to be able to watch this movie because it won't have any, uh, it, it might have some adult themes, but it won't have any overt sexual kind of scenes in there which is a big thing because you'd imagine a lot of movies especially nowadays in hollywood um especially if they have big male lead roles they're always gonna have a scene where the guy takes off his top and he's ripped and shit or the woman is in her underwear so it's always gonna be those kind of moments because they feel like those are the moments might kind of get you know get their movie to become more popular so they can kind of recoup the cops of the movie that they made bloody blah 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 so there might be a particular group of people who out there who probably saw christopher nolan as their guy because he's modest and now all of a sudden he does open a movie that you don't think would need a sexual scene in it and he's got the most sexual scene in he's ever had in all these movies and i can imagine why they wanted to close their eyes but it is quite funny just to kind of see these people out there in, in you know in social media saying what they're saying but like i said i think it is somewhat refreshing somewhat encouraging and we need more of it just to kind of counterbalance the overt sexual stuff that exists online in my personal opinion but again what do i know moving on 
Last subject to talk about, which is kind of funny, is this topic about Brooklyn skate shops. Sorry, Brooklyn projects, um, the skate shop out there in California that unfortunately has suffered at the hands of um, Hurricane Hillary, I think it is, right? That's ravaging across the sort of... Um, across the west coast so force of fears go out to people who've been negatively affected by it it definitely does look gnarly we've seen what's happening over there in maui and hawaii and force of feelings go out to people over there we can see how bad these things get i don't think it's as bad in parts of you know california la wherever it may be but i still think it's bad enough to kind of acknowledge it and say hey hopefully you guys are all right now one particular sketch shop brooklyn projects has always had these issues over the years with flooding um somehow their shop just hasn't got the necessary things in place that will prevent it from not suffering at the hands of flash flooding whether it's having the stock you know elevated whether it's having some pro you know something in place in the store that can alleviate the amount of water that comes in throughout the years i felt like i've always seen these clips whenever there's a flash flood whenever there's some sort of hurricane brooklyn projects always kind of suffers and their stock you know kind of gets destroyed off the back of it now that it's kept happening and it's becoming a kind of a constant, it kind of makes me think, is this negligence or is this just intended in terms of purposely getting your stock damaged so that you can sell it out the back door? Because we know, especially when it comes to limited edition shoes like Nike SBs, and in this particular topic, the issue is concerning the Nike SB um, Yoto Horigomi shoes, which are a SB that they did. I think the guy is a fucking Olympic gold medalist for skateboarding. I think it might have been the first one when skateboarding first got introduced at the Olympics. It's kind of an iconic thing. The colorway is a bit meh. I'm not really that into them. And I fucking hate dunks anyway. Oh, as a sidebar, are we all are we all kind of like pretending to like dunks lows or something? Because I feel like they're not the greatest shoe to wear with regular jeans or just with shoes or with shorts, whatever it may be. They just look a bit shit. I always preferred Air Force Ones over dunks anyway. And if I'm gonna wear dunks, I'm gonna wear highs. That's why one of the most legendary dunk colorways in the Tiffany dunk from back in the day or the Diamond Co. Supply dunk, I always was fucking annoyed when they first put them out that they weren't made in a high because I thought that colorway deserved to be put in a high. But regardless, this dunk love is a bit weird. So everyone's on dunks now. Everyone's fucking jacking these and they want them. Same way they want the fucking April skateboards and dunks that are meant to be coming out very, very soon. And obviously the release date is coming up. And just by coincidence, all of the stock that Brooklyn Projects had that they were going to sell has now been damaged by the water. And... Um, because it's been damaged, um, the owner of Brooklyn Projects, Dom DeLuca, decided to go on social media and basically get really grumpy with all the customers and fans that essentially have probably flooded his store, no pun intended, with phone calls ever since this video has been posted online. My issue with him getting angry at people contacting him trying to buy the shoes that are allegedly um, water damaged that he's going to throw away quote unquote, um, is that if you didn't want people to kind of rail your line and kind of, you know, make you annoyed why even upload the video why share this on social media it makes absolutely no sense but anyway let me play the video of dom deluca complaining about all these kids reaching out to him trying to buy the pairs of wet shoes that had been damaged courtesy of the hurricane that ravaged his store once again i just want to say um basically a big fuck you to all these fucking idiots that are hitting us up to buy fucking shoes. You know what, you wanna support the shop? Come to the shop and buy some fucking gear or product. Don't come asking me or anybody else about fucking wet ass shoes. We're not selling them, we're throwing them the fuck out. And that's that. So, y'all are fucking real goofy. And it just shows me what the world is really like because in a moment of like, fucked upness you guys are all thinking about yourself over shoes that's why resellers are the fucking dirge of the earth the funny thing he says that right is that in one way resellers are the dirge of the earth or are the scums of the earth in some ways i understand what he means but in another side of things without resellers would his skate shop still exist without a nike sb account would his skate shop still exist and a lot of these core skate shops have always annoyed me with this current rhetoric they have because I remember when I was coming up in the scene and I was working for Hypebeast when I was really young. I was one of the first employees at Hypebeast. So I used to blog for them back in the day. I used to do the blog when they used to be on Blogspot. I had my little business cards that I'd hand out to people being a contributing editor. I'd get paid like $50 uh, per article via PayPal 
big up Kevin Ma if you're still there holding down the for General Ma over there at fucking Hypebeast doing the damn thing. And I remember going to certain skate shops like Slam City Skates and a few other core skate shops around London and basically trying to talk to them about their skate, about their skate shop, maybe sort of an interview, maybe do a little street style picture thing, whatever it may be. And they would look at me like the scum on the bottom of their shoe. They'd fucking vibe me out of the store. They'd just be cunts about it. I think it, if I'm not mistaken, um, Slam City Skates had a thing in place where if you wanted to buy a pair of SBs, you had to do a kickflip or something right in order to buy a pair of limited edition shoes or if you no, sorry or if you could do a kickflip in the shoes that you were buying they would give you a discount on them or something or maybe you get them for free whatever somewhere along the lines but everything they did made you know that they despise the sneakerhead customer they despise that nike skateboarding which was a specifically you know the, the division of nike that was focused on skateboarding was mainly um, a, a, a division that kind of attracted sneakers because of the limited edition shoes they made. Obviously, they had, you know, some core colorways that they did season in, season out. But for the most part, people only cared about SBs when they were limited edition. So the kids and the sneakerheads would go there, queue up, buy the shoes and resell them. So no one was actually wearing them day to day. But I guess if you're a skate shop that generally doesn't get a lot of foot traffic, and then you get all these kids coming in only to buy the SBs, it can really make you feel, un, you know fucking worthless and feel like shit when they all leave with just the uh, sb shoes and they're not buying element t-shirts zoo york shit dc shit whatever else stuff krell trap chocolate stuff that's on the fucking racks picking up dust i fucking get it but your issue isn't with us isn't with the sneakerheads isn't with the quote-unquote hype beast which i've never been one is not with the streetwear heads it's with in general the kind of you know the system that exists around skateboarding shops and how they you know how they don't make a lot of money and how you know a lot of them sit on inventory and they don't really innovate and the kids themselves and now are buying a lot of stuff online or in big malls or in whatever department stores whatever it may be that's amazingly where your issue is so your ire is you'll usually that to the wrong person and even if you are a super core person and you hate that particular type of clientele coming into your store why not take away your fucking nike sb account why not go to nike sb and say hey i don't want to sell limited edition nike sbs anymore just give me the core stuff or just take away my account totally i don't want nike sb anymore you could do that but they don't so instead dom de luca like other skateboard shop owners out there that have an sb accounts that hate fucking sneakerheads and that hate streetwear kids in general they have this fucking bitterness that they have against people that like that sort of stuff and then they decide that his big age like this dom deluca guy might be early 50s early 60s decides to give the kids a middle finger to feel like a badass because these kids are ringing up his store wanting to buy stock that he currently owns wanting to put money in his till he's upset about it because he decided to put the video out there i don't know what to get sympathy to get clout whatever he decided to put the video out there on his social media platform and some entrepreneurial kids saw his opportunity to maybe buy some of these dunks that are maybe water damaged maybe air dry them out for a week and then resell them for you know double the money that they need and then use that money to buy some weed or whatever else that they usually buy who gives a fucking fuck but him discouraging entrepreneurial spirit because it gets on his nerves is hilarious him putting his middle finger up at kids who want to buy shoes and put money in his pocket is fucking hilarious when if he doesn't like the customers all he needs to do is cancel his own nike sb account will he do that obviously not but i also have my doubts on if he's going to throw away the shoes because this up and coming picture we have here from somebody maybe associated with brooklyn projects we have a whole entire floor full of these fucking horigomi fucking dunk sbs and they're all splayed across the floor and look what's at the bottom there there's a massive air conditioner of sorts blowing cold air all over these dunks that have been water damaged so maybe they're not that much damaged. They just need to get dried out and then they can be resold again. But all that hullabalab that he was talking about throwing them out isn't true because most likely Dom DeLuca is going to do what Dom DeLuca does, what he's known for being backdoor Dom DeLuca. And these are going to be sold to one or two people, backdoor, friends and family, hush, hush, wink, wink style. Because why else would you be drying them out if you're going to throw them out? Why would you get water damaged stuff, dry it out and then throw it out? You're just going to throw it out in its current condition. So all of this fucking posturing, all this crying online, all of this complaining for what? For absolutely nothing. In the end, he's going to chuck away the shoes and he's going to do exactly. So he's going to backdoor the shoes to somebody and he's going to give them to reseller one way or the other. 
He might not think of them as a reseller. He might think of them as an independent business owner. He might think of them as a fucking um, independent contractor or whatever he thinks of them, but they're still the same level of reseller. But then when you look at this other tweet here, courtesy of Sock Jig and also an account called Brandon, he has documented other occasions of, across the years when Dom DeLuca and Brooklyn Projects have had issues with flooding. And to me, I don't personally believe in fucking coincidences. And you have here January 12th, May 4th and August 20th, three separate occasions where Brooklyn Projects has somehow suffered from fucking flooding and hasn't made any improvements into how they manage their stock how they stock their inventory however you fucking call that shit in terms of having stuff in the fucking stock room they've made no adjustments over the years stuff gets kept stuff keeps getting damaged they keep having to throw away stuff or burn shit and i don't believe it it's probably a scam it's probably something that they do and work to their advantage or it's definitely a massive oversight from a business owner who's complaining about sneakheads and hype bees coming to their store but it makes a lot of sense because he can't run his business a sensible way and he can't make necessary improvements when his store currently keeps getting flooded it's absolutely ridiculous so all these occasions he keeps getting flooded he's made no effort to change it as you can see here from these accounts courtesy of fucking brandon and in my opinion something is definitely all right so don't be surprised if you see all of these damaged boxed um you know horigami um dunk sb showing up at your nearest fucking sneaker reseller platform very very soon i really really do think it's gonna happen so um let's see this other fucking quote here from the brandon post it says um, a person asks him and says hey bro bro needs to invest in some inventory shelves brandon replies and says i bet his inventory shelves burned down in multiple fires back in 2020 uh brooklyn project's been getting attacked by the neighborhood for a minute i guess so they get attacked by fire and by water this feels like one of those fucking avatar scripts right it's fucking crazy if this is real so this is a fucking um uh i think a screenshot from one of their posts back in the day that says here's the pos in the act a piece of shit i'm assuming we saw him earlier didn't give him a hard time about making a fucking mess we know what a large percentage of people in the streets are decent people that fell on hard times this is not one of them this dude is a piece of shit and a drug addict derelict in the video you'll see him taking a bigger piece of cardboard to add to the small fire that he started unfucking believable okay so somebody purposely decided to burn their shit again arson okay cool somebody decides to pick on one store to fucking burn i'm not really too sure if that's believable i'm not really too sure if that's an inside job allegedly who really knows but i do want to go back to the fucking persona of these skate shop owners of this fucking retail streetwear store owner type of persona this kind of quasi retail mafia type of guy because i feel like i'm a strong individual i have my own convictions and i'm not going to be put off from something because one person gives me a bad experience but i can say from my unfortunate bad experience dealing with one of the founders of palace that i've never worn palace since the day it first started because i was one of the first people to buy one of the first sh shirts they used to put in you know they put on fucking retail stores i think i bought one of the first inside out palace trifeg fucking triangle t-shirts back in the day but i met one of the founders he was a fucking cunt to me or we had a bad interaction maybe i was a cunt maybe he was a cunt regardless i didn't like it and i've never worn that shit since then right and every time i mention the brand i'm saying it's fucking shit i'm never gonna not say shit because i fucking hate it cool so i also think there was a time in my life when i was growing up and i was into skateboarding and i'd go to skate shops and I was young and I was into sneakers more so than into skateboarding. And I looked the way I did and I was, you know, maybe one of the first kind of guys from ends. I would go in these stores that wasn't some black kid from fucking Labrook Grove that would go in there. And I always felt like they would vibe me out and it kind of didn't give me, I don't know, didn't just treat me nice when I went in there. And it usually would leave a lasting impression where it kind of made me question whether I wanted to skate anyway. And it really just let, made, let, you know, left a bad taste in my mouth. Over the years, reading forums, reading magazines, listening to interviews and shit, watching fucking skateboarding podcasts and shit, I realized that that's a standard thing that most skate shop owners do to vibe out customers to kind of, you know, weed out the fucking posers and the people who are not really about that life to sort of keep skateboarding pure and keep it core. You can't really now, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. They fucking sell skateboards in fucking Argos. It's not core anymore. Palace is collaborating with fucking McDonald's. It's fucking gone. 
But I understand them trying to do so because they have maintained it has maintained more of its integrity than fucking rollerblading or than fucking BMXing and something. So maybe all of that work, all of that bad vibes, all of that attitude, all of these older dudes thinking they're 21 and shit, it's kind of added to the allure. But fundamentally, there is a really losery, pathetic vibe about a guy that looks the way that Dom DeLuca looks, who is his age putting the middle finger up at little kids there's nothing more cringe about life in general than being this guy i nothing. just want to say um basically a big fuck you like there's nothing more cringe to a being this guy being the fucking middle-aged retail owner of a store with mainly young people feeling like you're a badass because you just happen to live a long time you were born many many years ago so you were around when shit basically started but it doesn't make you special it doesn't make you cool or anything or anything along those kind of lines and then you have this fucking attitude in your older age there's nothing more cringy about it and i'm so happy so thankful that i'm not that guy i'm so thankful i can enjoy the things i enjoy the way that i enjoy them i just kind of keep it moving i let the kids have their space i understand what the game is i kind of keep my you know i mind my business i keep it moving i don't have this bitter entitled angry grumpy persona because and effectively if dom deluca isn't 50 isn't 60 and he's actually 45 that's what it does to you it makes you look fucking old it makes you look weathered it makes you look tired and you end up looking like a fucking fool and eventually you will end up selling it to resellers somewhere along the line so that's why i saw i thought that was funny and i'm wondering what's gonna happen i wonder if all this hype and all this fucking mold gate all this fucking you know stuff happening with the fucking shoes being damaged by water i wonder if it's going to somehow positively impact the value of the shoes i wonder if everyone's going to be jumping on these because of the drama around them and all the history surrounding these shoes in general because the colorway for me isn't nothing to shout home about i generally don't give a fuck about dunks like that anyway but i wonder if all of this sort of like backstory is actually going to add to the allure of these shoes if we're going to see them go for crazy amounts of stock x on ebay and shit i wonder I bloody wonder. Anyway, that has been it for the Axino Zinger Show episode number 700. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company on this maiden, on this fucking iconic milestone of a fucking show. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please let me know by sending me some sort of correspondence. I'll put a contact me flipping button down below if you want to send me any praise for reaching the 700 landmark. If you don't, you please just make sure you pour out a drink for me you know cheers to the sky maybe do a little cross sign or something santo domingo jesus christ hallelujah whatever it may be that'd be greatly appreciated you could also leave me a five star review if you actually want to do that to so thank me for the 700 episode do that five star review on apple or on the spotify fucking app if you want to do that that'd be greatly appreciated if you listen to the audio podcast you'll hear my tune of the day to celebrate 700 and then I will see all the rest of you guys on the other side for another episode of the Agostino Zinger Show. But until next time, my friends, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you all very, very soon. Peace.